Uh, good afternoon. I hope you are fresh and excited by the morning conversations. Every time I'm asked by somebody, how did you end up in the field of sustainability, it's so depressing. I have a response to that, that I think never before has it been such an exciting time in this field. Never before than in the last five years or so did we have so much innovation, so much radical change coming out. And particularly exciting part for me is that, that it's business, not any other engine, but exactly business as a sector of society that is driving this change. So I feel more invigorated by the challenges than depressed. And I hope that this panel will also share with that. And I do mean it in a very provocative way. I think it's surprising that it's business who is, uh, which is, or who is, often blamed for the challenges in which we're in. It's also business that is now leading the solution wave, so why not look at them? From the organizer's stand, we were asked to do the following. We asked each to prepare a short five minutes or so statement of where we are on the subject of sustainability. And then after that, it would be a very interactive session. So we hope that we have a real conversation with each other. Not with each other, meaning four of us, but we will have a very open conversation. Is that all right with you? Yeah? Then I will speak rather briefly from my point of view. And I'm unapologetically coming here, first as a manager and second as an investor. So when I speak about sustainability, I will speak from that point of view, even though my home is very happy being management, I try to translate it in academic sense. But at my heart, this is a management challenge, so this is where this will come from. So embedded sustainability, or why the subject of this panel is from Bolton to embedded sustainability. So the starting point of the conversation is, what do we mean by sustainability? If you open the uh, definition of every kind, from Wikipedia to the dictionary, from business media to biology, from um, public uh, MTV newsstands to Vogue magazine. It seems like every single one of those outlets has something to say about what we mean by sustainability. So we don't need to debate exact definition, but rather share the perspectives of what we mean. And for me, this to the heart comes to the essence of what business is doing, which is creating value. Not all businesses are doing that, but that was the point of creating the first corporation, is creating value. And in that sense, sustainability is very simple, is ability to sustain itself. Are we there tomorrow? Do we exist tomorrow? It's a very simple definition. If you ask a typical question to a typical manager, what is sustainability to you? The very simple answer is financial sustainability, and they're also unapologetic about that. We just heard many concerns about that, the short-term sightedness of financial sustainability and so on. But that's what we train our managers to do. Sustainability for them means, do we have profitable quarter? That's pretty much what sustainability and the timeline where we are. But that fundamental question, are we there tomorrow, and are we there in the next quarter, is coming under attack or is being challenged and pressured by, in my view, three very deeply interdependent trends. And that is declining resources, increasing expectations, and all of that happening in the context of radical transparency. Never before this kind of transparency was present with those pressures intervening. So what do we mean by that? Declining resources. If you talk about creating value and what are the drivers of creating value, it's very clear that there is a number of drivers. For example, our ability to create a good product, our ability to have excellent facilities in operation, our ability to have healthy, productive employees. And now under attack because of a rapid decline of natural resources of every kind, rapid decline of such resources as trust, rapid decline of such resources as stable climate. So those pressures make a new opportunity or new challenge for business to address. Just basically connected to that is this corresponding trends, which is increasing expectations. So not only our resources are coming down, but more and more pressures are coming to us from different parts of society. So this is customers who are expecting new things. This is governments who are putting new regulations. This is media. This is investors. This is community at large and so on. 
So if we just look at the basic, basic numbers, many of you, of course, are in present and debate on how much oil do we have left, how much gold do we have left, and that's projected to be done by about 2050. But also just basic things, nutrition. Anybody here who doesn't eat? Yeah? We are looking at the nutrition declining, fly, uh, decline of nutrition. Um, basic studies of garden crops. In the last 20 years, across garden crops variety, we are losing as much as 20% of vitamin C. We can predict a tomato that will be as ripe and as red in 20 years and will have absolutely no nutritional value. So if you're a manager and you're producing a can of tomato soup and you have a requirement to list the nutrition value of that product, and the new batch of tomatoes every year has less and less nutritional value, how do you manage that? How do you address that as a challenge, as a competitive challenge? Same with the species. Everyone is, of course, speaking about biodiversity, but to a simple person on the product line of those little tuna cans, that is not an issue. The tuna comes in, comes out. This year, 2012, was the first time when a single tuna fish was sold for over $700,000 on an auction. One tuna fish, $700,000. Why? Because there's a rapid decline, and unfortunately, there's a lag. So as a manager, you don't always appreciate the, rap the rapidness of decline, and you find out that your entire supply chain disappeared in front of you. A bit too late. So that's on decline in resources, but connected to that, of course, is increasing expectations. So first time ever, we have governments who are banning use of plastic bags, banning use of plastic bottles. If you are Coca-Cola, a company we are partnering with very happily for many years, how do you manage that? How do you create products without use of plastic bottles? If that is the competitive environment in which you exist. So there, of course, life expectancy. There are more of us will live longer. It's a threat and opportunity simultaneously. We have investors, especially pension funds now, starting to ask different questions of the companies. If they are ready to show not only short-term quarterly reports, but very long-term. Will you be there for our customers who will retire in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and so on? And corresponding, of course, to that is that if you think about 100 years ago, how we created value 100 years ago, one little thing did not exist in this picture, and this is this. The world was simply not transparent. We didn't have government pressures in the way we have now. We didn't have media. We didn't have academia. We didn't have social media. We didn't have the uh, environment of transparency in which we exist today. So in that sense, the three trends, declining resources, uh, increasing expectations and transparency are the new pressures in which we need to think about sustainability of our value creation. Are we there tomorrow? Is our company still in business tomorrow with all of those pressures? And some of them are more present in some markets than others. So what kind of responses we've seen from business so far? Response number one, this is just a cost. This is unfortunate, horrible, new tax, horrible new trend, we need to have a great new department of social responsibility. Let's create some PR dividends out of it. This is the way we're going to deal with it. We just have a budget. We have a nice donation system. We're done. Our hands are clean. That has been the prevailing response, looking at the new social environmental pressures as a pure cost, hopefully recovering some of the PR dividends out of it, no radical innovation of any kind. Second response. Some companies bolt on a new sustainability measure to their existing strategy, to their existing products line, and so on. It's a kind of band-aid. So let's uh, create maybe a new project. We have a normal line of products and one product we call green. Remember those grocery stores where we have normal milk and then there's an organic, bio, clean, green milk? Kind of makes you wonder what is in that other milk. So this creates a very unstable environment for the company itself. When you have a normal product and then one sustainable product, the customers begin questioning your entire product line. What are you selling us in those other normal products? But many companies choose to use bolt-on sustainability as a way to kind of band-aid the situation. It's a niche for them, it's a margin, it's a small project, and so on. 
And then the exceptionally new and exciting trend is that there are a random but growing number of companies who decide to embed sustainability into the very DNA of their companies. This is not anymore a marginal, uh, nice, morally pleasant thing to do that we do when we are in the good times. This is something of who we are. This is what we do on a daily basis. This is deeply embedded into products, services, products, and operations. And here, this is really full integration across all functions. This is not about creating a scapegoat department of sustainability or a poor, poor officer who has to run around with no power in a company. This is about real integration into line management. And when that happens, when embedded sustainability is there, not only it's an opportunity to mitigate risk or increase efficiency, but it also becomes a factor of differentiating your product. It becomes an opportunity to enter or create new markets, to enhance brand of the company and the value of the intangibles. It's also an opportunity to really challenge the industry standards, but most importantly, this is a driver of radical innovation. So to conclude that, let me illustrate. How many of you are um, kind of on a daily basis, maybe not daily, maybe on a weekly basis, uh, here are some new green products coming up. Yeah, advertisement for a green product. What comes to mind when you hear green product? Let's think about price. Is it cheaper or more expensive? more expensive? Absolutely, usually more expensive. Is it performing as well as their normal product? Uh, many of you are kind of shaking your hands. Yes, usually it's not performing very well. Uh, is it beautiful aesthetically? Most of the time not. So here's a typical shoe. This is an actual product. This is a sustainable shoe. Actually sold right now. It's ugly. It doesn't perform very well, and it's double more expensive than a normal shoe, but it is a green shoe. This is what we mean by bolt on sustainability. We created the product, we band-aided the problem, but it didn't resolve the issue of embedding new principles into the entire system, whether it's economic system of one company across the value chain. Now, if we move from bolt on to embedded sustainability, how does it actually look? Here's one example from a company you know very well, Puma. Puma introduced last year what they call Clever Little Bag. It has nothing to do with a shoe. It's a packaging solution. The packaging solution started with a very simple question. Why do we box our shoes and then use an extra bag in the store to give to our customers, which they need to throw away, it goes straight to the landfill? Can we think of something different? Can we combine a reusable bag, which they can use actually in schools or somewhere else, with the actual package? Can we also make it lighter so the transportation, CO2 emissions, the cost to the company, the use of the fuel is much reduced? Can we think of radically different way of packaging? And notice, they didn't call it green bag. It's a clever little bag. So that's what we mean by embedded sustainability. It's a radical innovation. It's rethinking the model altogether. So with that, I would like to pass it on to my wonderful panel, who will all also take a little bit of time, about five minutes, to share their views of what they mean by sustainability before we turn to all of us and discussing it. And I would like to invite first to the table from the BMW Group, one of the companies that is really leading the way in sustainable mobility, uh, the Vice President of Governmental Affairs, uh, Dr. Thomas Becker. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, I would like to illustrate some of the things that you have been describing with some examples. When the BMW Group established the first environmental officer in the year 1973, this was basically a constraint manager. That was the guy who took care of things not spilling over that shouldn't spill over. Uh, things not being emitted that should not be emitted. Today, when we talk about the sustainability of our production, I come to our products, obviously, this has changed radically. First of all, because if you charge customers a premium price and nobody buys a BMW because he needs it, you buy it because you want it and because you, you like it, it's about the brand. It's about our our core asset. And that means that today we are confronted with the need to be able to management things that occur 
far away from our own operations, far away from our factories, but in supply chain tier number, not number one or number two necessarily, but number five or number six, which tens of thousands of tiny bits and pieces that go into our vehicle, clearly no. Can we monitor them all? No, we can't. Do we have, therefore, to rely on mechanisms like certifications, like third-party controls, like the role of non-governmental organization? Yes, obviously, we have to. And does our responsibility change in that sense? It obviously does. When it was about containing wastewater, when it was about recycling production waste in plant Regensburg, this is something which is 100% our job. But if it is about making sure that some iron ore blocks are not made with the involvement of slave labor or with the destruction of rainforests, this is something that is different, where our role can only be to establish the mechanisms to properly respond to any kind of complaint, to any kind of issue that anybody identifies and makes us aware of, which we do and which we did in the named case very recently. So that was production. Let's talk about the product. The first wave of how the external world, how things like the environmental impact of our product became relevant was legislation about safety in the 1950s and 60s. Then in the 70s and 80s, it was all about emissions. Government said you have to put a catalytic converter into your vehicles, a particle filter or whatever. I mean, most cases, industry did not really love the idea. But at the end of the day, it was the same for everybody. It meant for everybody to screw the same stuff in or beneath or wherever into the car. It had no effect on your position in the market. It would not make some company look good, the other look bad. That has changed with CO2 dramatically, I would say. Not only because regulation like CO2 fleet averages, like the one adopted in the US last week, have an impact on the cost position, on the competitive position of various competing companies, but also because it matters for the customer. If you look at the fact that half of the BMWs in Europe are sold to commercial customers, these are people who more and more care about the consumption of their vehicle, not only because of their own reputation, which is a very relevant factor, but also because they just do the math. And talk about talking about total cost of ownership, with more and more countries in Europe, the majority in the meantime, among them Slovenia, having adopted CO2-based vehicle taxation systems, this makes people consider these things. And clearly, in the next phase, it is also the investors who ask, are you prepared for that? Do you have a proper grip of these processes, what's happening, how the per perception of your products, of your company is changing, not only with a view to the regulator, but with the customer? So that was the past. Let me finish by giving an outlook on what's ahead of us. If we talk about electric mobility, and we have been investing and still do so some billions into this with building up a completely new supply and production chain that ranges from a carbon fiber manufacturing facility in the state of Washington in the US to Bavaria to Leipzig, because our vehicles are going to be the first products made of carbon fiber in serious production motor production, then the situation is like that. You have a very challenging new technology, unknown to the customer, with many question marks out there. You have an economic environment at the moment in Europe, which is like it was described this morning, with strong restrictions on the ability of governments to subsidize, for example, a new technology into this market. And then we lose control of one of the core elements of sustainability of our product, which is its CO2 footprint. When we burn fossil fuels, 95% of what goes out into the atmosphere is decided by our engineers, and 5% by the guys who build the refineries when oil is made into petrol. With electricity, it's precisely the other way around. We define the way how much kilowatt hours we will need to drive a mile, but the way how that's electricity is produced is way beyond our control. So that means that from one moment to another, it is 27 uncoordinated energy policies in Europe which impact on the perception of our product. So we need others to enable us to deliver a product which is perceived probably positively by our customers and which are motivated 
to buy a relatively high price for this completely new challenging technology. When the discussion about the environmental impact of biofuel popped up a few years ago, it took only eight weeks of massive media fire to completely turn around the perception of this approach to sustainable mobility. A few weeks. If that happens to us with the way we power our electric vehicles, we have a problem. And this is why when you are going to be able to purchase, as of next year, an electric BMW in Europe, you are going to have as one of the options a contract for the supply of the energy out of renewable sources coming with the vehicle. So we have to engage into a completely new field of business as a result of this situation. So having said that, thank you. This was kind of a perfect illustration of the many challenges that we're facing. And the remarkable new thing that is happening with the sustainability trends is that no longer you can think of your company as a castle anymore. You have to think about the entire system, horizontal and vertical. And your last uh, comment on the fact that many companies are now forced to venture into energy, into completely new fields, is the fact that we now have to think in systems, not in companies. Well, to help us figure this out better, uh, I would like to invite here the president of Going Global Ventures, a uh, person who is very familiar also with the knowledge economy and the works in this field, Mark Minevich. Thank Welcome. Thank you very much, Nadia. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here at the BLED Strategic Forum and participate at the BLED Business uh, Forum discussion. So I'd like to thank the hosts, uh, the Business School, as well as the BLED Strategic uh, Group uh, leadership uh, that has organized this event, as well as the government of Slovenia, uh, which is taking a very aggressive measures, I believe, in the field of sustainability. So. Um, as Nadia mentioned, my background uh, deals with both uh, investments, uh, venture capital, um, uh, the issue of this whole green economy, and knowledge workforce. Uh, in 2005, uh, I have written, together with Professor Lehman, actually I've interviewed him uh, in my book, where is this world going? And the emphasis of the knowledge worker, which I now equate to the sustainable worker. Uh, because two and two are connected, as you mentioned. And this is what we were talking in 2005 and 2006, and now some of the changes are coming together. But unfortunately, they're not coming together because of the governments. Unfortunately, they're not coming together because of the United Nations. Unfortunately, they're not coming together because of the IMF. They're coming together because of entrepreneurs, and knowledge workers that came about and created very successful models, which I will talk about. The governments more or less are falling behind. And what we hear more and more is governments are talking about hyping things up. We are the Asian century. This is what I hear. We are the Middle East century because of all the strikes and because of all of the negativity and because of all of the havoc and chaos which is occurring. The issues are not about Asia or not about Middle East, because today it's about entrepreneurs and it's about very innovative companies. It's not even about multinationals anymore uh, that have taken control and uh, really focusing on driving their own agenda and their own policies and the whole micro view of this world. It's about knowledge focused entrepreneurs. And in order to have those knowledge focused entrepreneurs, and to have this new economy, which I talk about constantly in my meetings, investment meetings and corporate meetings, you have to position a competitive, very competitive program and a platform. And this competitive program and platform discusses, really focuses on creation of very sophisticated R&D, um, uh, high-tech uh, high uh, ecosystem, high-tech high eco-clusters, and those eco-clusters, those sustainable, renewable eco-clusters around the world, whether it's United States, my country, or other countries around the world, they will take the leadership. Equating to this, IBM calls it smart cities. Whatever they are, those smart clusters are the ones which will be driving innovation together with all the portfolio companies around the world, not the governments, 
not, not, not multinationals. Of course, you need partners to do everything. So now when we look at the overall picture, where this is all going, $1.7 trillion is going to go in in the smart clusters, smart eco-clusters around the world. Tremendous amount of money for sustainable vendors, for, for real estate developers in sustainability, for ecology partners to invest and profit, but also to do good uh, in this world. And I hope we, we move forward. Uh, with this, there's lots of initiatives already. Just a few days ago, I was named as a senior advisor to the Sustainia Initiative, a very large think tank uh, in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, focusing on this whole sustainable development and our future. Because our future is tied, as Nadia mentioned, how we live, how we work. We want to do better. We want to live better. We're not comfortable. We're confined right now. Nothing works. You know, we spoke out. Nothing works. The old systems are falling apart. The governments are disintegrated. The policies are too radical. They're too liberal. They're not connected. They're multiplexed. We need something better. And I think those smart clusters, those innovative, innovative decision-making processes, those frameworks, will make a difference. Let me share some figures with you. We, spoke, we speak about uh, clean tech and sustainability. Some, you know, there's some correlation here, but in, in the clean tech alone, in 2011, $284 billion was raised in global markets. Astonishing numbers. And in a sustainability slash clean tech, Bef uh, projections coming in from uh, clean tech group, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, by 2011, by 2017, I'm sorry, we will have, in global markets, we'll position close to $1.3 trillion. The growth absolutely is the fastest. I'm not disputing in the BRIC economies. Probably by the multiple of 2 to 4x multiple. That's phenomenal growth. But we've got to be prepared and we've got to get the infrastructure in place. Let me also share with you that from the startup perspective, Venture capital from since the 2002, because we keep bringing back those moments, right? Everybody, we're, we have flashbacks today, 2000, 2001, 2002. After the September the 11th, in the, you know, the movement of putting money in clean tech only grew tremendously, $50 billion invested. However, I will make a statement because I, you know, I work with the investment industry and, and some of the funds that I represent invest billions of dollars of capital. And what we have found that a lot of the investments that were made uh, since 2002 are made without border protections, border operations, lack of relationships, lack of insights to assist portfolio companies, not flexible in deal strategies and structures. So in itself, if we're going to deal with sustainability as a business opportunity, as a real business opportunity and as a new asset class, we better prepare to make sure we do things as other investors do at corporate and corporate uh, M&A groups do all the time. So that's one thing. I wanted to mention also that we as a society right now put emphasis on government, on government-centric policies. Let the government figure out the credits. Let the government worry about the banking, the sustainable banking practices. Less government, more private sector, more initiatives focused on the private entrepreneur. And I think even more important, if we could balance this picture out and create a smart, what I call smart balanced world of thought leadership, of investors who are sustainable investors, and this is a whole new asset class which we should discuss today called impact investing. Impact investing has grown probably five to six times uh, the, uh, from the original uh, initiation of years ago in, from 2004 to 2005. Uh, we need corporations not only playing lip service but actually be much more involved with the investors and family offices uh, and endowments. And we need to really understand that the, all of those industries, as I mentioned to you, the smart cities, the eco clusters, the clean tech, very much interconnected, and we need a cohesive strategic policy, a so-called sustainable policy, sustainable, uh, concentrated, integrated approach. And what we have is right now approach which is piecemeal. It's not an integrated approach. It's approach which is not based on, on components which are integrated. It's piecemeal at best. A lot of it is because we put too much emphasis on the government-centric policies. Look, 
the Obama administration in, 2000, in 2009, when they came in, promised, made a commitment to the world that we will lead in, in sustainable, sustainable development. We will lead in clean tech technologies. A lot of the, what I have discussed in venture capital investment did not come from the administration. In fact, you know, we see very few successes. A lot of money being spent on stimulus projects and government initiatives. We see very little being actually done uh, in terms of actually creating what we call sustainable companies of tomorrow. That's not what has occurred. So United States is not leading. Now, we speak about China and India and other countries. Uh, you know, the professor just moments ago and, uh, and others have mentioned that growth has slowed down. And I expect the growth will slow down even further as we go into 2013, 2014. I am not sure who will be the engine driver of the world. Right now, we are faced with a situation where the more innovative you are, the more human capital potential you have, the more sustainable business development models that you have, those companies, those players, those geographic players will be much more successful. We're not sure that Asia it will lead the world, or if it's coming from South America, uh, poverty there is just beyond, uh, uh, it's unprecedented. So I think we have to really focus on the integrated approach. We have to look on how we create jobs with sustainability. What different models are we going to create? And let me just share some other information uh, uh, with you. When we look at the statistics, we look at, at the overall picture, energy. Energy is about energy generation, energy storage, energy infrastructure, energy efficiency. When we look at water, we, look, we have to look at filtration, we have to look at purification, we have to look at water conservation, wastewater treatments. Uh, when we look at recycling, somebody's uh, brought this out, and waste management, and we have to include all recycling services and waste treatment services. In agriculture today, we have to improve land management, natural pesticides, natural fertilizers and irrigations. We have to do a lot more than just investing in technology. We've got to create it as a professional business, so professional services organizations around the world like IBM, like Siemens, many others could come and help to create this whole new, um, what I call the new industry which is coming together. So when you look at the market space, I want to break it down so you really understand the numbers, market space, uh, energy generation market space, just in energy generation, that market space has a potential of $500 billion. We have taken advantage very, very minutia a minutia potential in solar, in wind, in geothermal, in marine. Some of this is happening in Slovenia. I'm very impressed with the, some of the Slovenian entrepreneurs that I met as part of our investment delegation. I think that they're rated in, certainly in the top five in terms of the clean tech industry. Real estate, $500 billion market. There's a lot of potential here, so the industry should really do more. Insulation, lightning, metering, appliances. There's lots of solutions on small scale. We've got to get it up from the venture capital, get it up, spin it out from M&A groups, uh, from the corporate world, get it out to the market. Transportation, $500 billion market, huge potential. Engines, electric uh, vehicles, uh, fleet logistics, biofuels. we got to do something on a larger scale to make those improvements. Um, l listen, we, uh, there's a lot of discussion today on the emerging markets. I, I agree that based on the IMF forecasts, there are certain emerging markets which are probably going to be growing you know, at a tremendous pace. A lot of it has to do, again, I repeat, on what kind of clusters, what kind of smart cities and clusters they will create. If someone is claiming that they are going to create a hub in the middle of nowhere and they will just reposition all this human capital artificially funded, you know, with some money coming in from very wealthy families, so that's not going to work. We need to have public sector, private sector working together to create those communities, create those clusters, attract human, uh, attract human capital, create new innovation centers, and start moving this process forward to create our new economy. We, Tired old models not working, falling apart, disintegrating. New models have to be developed, and I think the way you develop them is through the smart city clusters. This is where you're going to have all of your sustainable technologies, sustainable solutions, and sustainable markets. There are 3 billion people in the emerging markets. Uh, more, they, they are going to be the one driving this whole sustainable economy, middle class consumers. And I think that they will increase by 147% 
according to the McKinsey study, in real commodity prices. So we're going to have huge need for, for, sustainable, for sustainable development. Some of the opportunities, uh, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just end this conversation by, by telling you that uh, big things that we should be looking at in, in the world of sustainability, energy, water, uh, land, and steel. And right now, the developing countries are going to be your huge potential. So if you're a corporation, if you're an investor, you know, just on energy alone, 71% yeah, 70 according to McKinsey are going to be from, from developing countries. Water, 84%, land, 83%, steel, 73%. And I'm talking about not only, you know, your BRIC economies, I'm talking about your Central Asian countries, I'm talking about South Asia, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, Laos and, and, and Korea. A lot of potential, I think we have to think about this whole global picture. We gotta think that this is a complex initiative. We just can't work alone and think that the corporation will solve this problem, that this government will solve the problem, the European Union could solve it. They can't. This is, a, this is a very complicated set of issues, and investors are trying to get some impulse from this overall market in order where they're going to invest, where they're going to put this impact investing, which areas of the world, which companies, which innovators. And I hope we will have a very interesting discussion on this. Thank you. Your emphasis, Mark, on the role of an individual entrepreneur as opposed to any of the old structures is a very nice prelude for our next speaker, who is an entrepreneur. And I'm very happy to have here Robert Grach, who represents Grach Automotive Group, who works not only in mobility, but also in lightning and appliances. So thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Nadia. Uh, as the name of the company says, uh, we, we are coming from the automotive industry. We have produced the parts for the car industry, wire harnesses, uh, uh, for external and internal car mirrors, lights, electronics, electronics for car, which includes rear, uh, uh, rear car lights, interior lights, turn signal lights, but everything based on LED. The big crisis in 2008 did not leave my companies uh, unharmed, and our sales figures dropped for 60% overnight. We reorganized us immediately and started a completely new strategy. In just one year and a half, we managed to come back to the same level of the sales that we had before the crisis. In the third year, we increased our sales by 40%, last year, 30%, uh, 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 and this year we expect additional 30% uh, increasing, increase. And what was the strategy that we introduced? After setting our target and our path on our way to the target, we came to the joint conclusion, sustainable development. And how should sustainable development looks like? Looks like. The, reply, the reply was very clear to us. Sustainable development should guarantee us a, continu a continuously uh, a growth, provide new workplaces, and be at the same time environment, an environmental friendly and economical. Having this guidance in our mind, we started this uh, with development of our products and technologies. Since we had a lot of experience with, uh, with uh, electronics and LED technologies for automotive industry, and both are related to illumination, we decided to concentrate on development of LED lights for street, that means street lights, exterior lights, interior lights, all what we can illuminate. illuminate. Already during development stage, we become fascinated with the idea of the lowest energy consumption in our production and with the use of material that we are uh, that are uh, uh, environmental friendly. The result, wa the result was a new generation of lights which need almost no maintenance for more than 100,000 hours and have less power consumption up to 95 percent uh, 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 with compar in comparison with the common lights, but we are, you still can see on the streets. All lights reduce this pollution uh, impact with CO2 up to 1,000 kilo per year per lamp, depend on the size of the lamps. And what did we achieve with this for the company and for the environmental? First, we secured continuous, continuous development of our product and our sales, and also provided for the future of our company. This is the e economic development. Secondly, with the new technologies and products, we contributed to a dramatic reduction of energy consumption, both in the face of production and technologies, as well as later on when the products are already in use, 
That's mean it, it's not only on the products what we need to do, also the technology, also the after when the products are on the street. This is an environmental protection aspect, which means that we do not work only for our generation, but also for the next generation. And the third, the company is expanding its production, opening new plants, workplaces, new jobs. That, uh, the result is a, a stability for the narrow area and also for the state, and that is the social aspect. And at the end, let me also mention that the, we use the same concept when we develop the new generation or the new field where we, uh, of the production or the product, what we do, uh, 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 the new field, uh, uh, the new generation of induction cooker, where the same condition were followed, using less energy to achieve higher efficiency. When we look into the future, indulge in our thoughts, there is a question that we have to answer. How does continuous sustainable development look like then? My answer is quite simple. Sustainable development is the one which guarantees economic, environmental friendly, and social stability. All that we need to define is the conditions which will, uh, which will allow us to reach the goal continuously. Just to summarize, as an opening for your questions and comments and um, input, few themes that are coming up under this big subject of how do we move from bolt-on to embedded sustainability. Um, I think what we heard from Thomas is the um, idea that if we look at the history, 50s and the 70s, this was the necessary cost. Now it's becoming an opportunity for real competitive advantage. This is what can uh, differentiate you from a company. Also the idea that you have to look beyond just the company into the whole system, that you cannot anymore just take care of what's going on within the boundaries of the company, but go into your supply chain deeply, go into completely new markets and industries and so on. Also from Mark, the concept of uh, moving from top-down control to bottom-up entrepreneurship. That what solutions are coming from is from this new rise of entrepreneurship and um, clustering those together, synergy between those efforts. And also from Robert, the idea that you need to move beyond just one product into a totally intelligent solution, that this has to be a solution, that the product itself works, but also it creates new jobs, it creates an opportunity for the entire government, and so on. So from product to total solution. These are some of the themes of possibilities, and I wonder what questions you might have or what comments does this evoke. Is this something you are facing in your companies, in your countries, or something that you think is utopian? Yep, we have a question. We need a microphone. In today's discussion is the financial system, and what, what is, in your view, sustainable finance? How close are we to the first step to, that the finance sector would consider sustainability as cost that it has to assume? Let's mm -hmm. forget the further steps. Anybody wants to pick that up? I can, yeah, we can go to the venture capital first, and then I can speak of very simple examples as well. Yeah, let me, let me try to address from an uh, uh, investment point of view, uh, there, there is a change that has occurred, a radical change, where investments which are done in a sustainable space today have to go through the same scrutiny that any other investment. So there is, however, a lot of the uh, a lot of the work that has to be done to make the product or service or, so, or solution sustainable produces some form of societal good. And I think this is where the creation of this whole new impact investing uh, is coming in. The impact in the investors are expecting returns. They're not expecting their returns that the venture capital or the private equity industry has been expecting. So in the past 20%, uh, 25% uh, IRR. But they are expecting returns somewhere from you know, 6% to 12% uh, return on a uh, yield return uh, because there's some societal measurements that have to be done and 
thankfully we have groups stepping in in financial sector which are doing which are actually providing those types of societal measurements that it's being currently being done by a group called GRIN headed up by the Rockefeller Foundation Bill Gates Foundation Morgan Stanley and others are coming up with a new financial st uh, uh, measurements on how you measure on how they measure the return from a societal point of view plus the financial uh, plus the financial performance but again uh, uh, what you had before is you had idea that, yeah, it wasn't, as Nadia said and Thomas said, that previously to that, nothing, no, the, the products or services were not integrated into the, uh, into the corporation or uh, they were not the prime motivator uh, to deliver products to the consumer, but some exotic audience, some really minor market. Today, you have to think that this is a, a large a market, addressable market opportunity. I just told you that, that in three sectors, uh, from the generation of energy to water supply uh, to infrastructure. It's a $500 billion market, so treat it seriously like every other investment opportunity. Uh, I have colleagues with me today who are, uh, you know, who are in the investment world, and they will also tell you that those things have to be scrutinized. Due diligence have to be done. You have to put the right valuation into the company, look at the management team, look at the product, look at the ability to addressable market, the competitive information, what are you doing differently? Uh, and I think it's more and more judged as a real business. Uh, however, in this impact investing, there is now a split which is occurring. So you have some societal, um, uh, societal um, IRR and you have the financial IRR. And hopefully in a couple of years, once this is an accepted asset class globally, which I think it's headed into that direction, uh, those measurements should be much more rigid and strict. Well, let me add to that a little bit of example. So what's going on with the financial market as I see it. Um, to put it completely bluntly, percentage-wise, so think of all um, the entire system uh, of uh, capital in the world, 99% of that system, if not 99.9, .9, is business as usual, meaning we we'll look at the immediate short-term investment using traditional criteria. Um, if we can be creative with derivatives or any other new products, we will be, we are speculating openly financial markets work as usual. Now, to that 99.9% .9 comes uh, um, in a way that through the asphalt comes uh, a kind of little tiny green. Through that comes completely new concepts. So, and some of them are not new at all. If you look in the banking sector in Europe, two examples that I adore, Rabobank and Erste Bank, both have done amazing work in assessing investment opportunities and pursuing investment opportunities, not in the last five years, but for decades. And um, they do really innovative products to resolve real social problems. Problems such as what happens to entire society around a uh, foreign exchange rate when the loan is given in a foreign currency and then the currency collapses and the entire society comes down, that was the reason for the late 90s um, collapse and the financial crisis in the Asia is, was foreign exchange lending. So now we have products on the market where you can insure yourself uh, f against that ill. And that was the innovation that was societally and sustainably driven. Now from the private investor point of view, socially responsible investment and the impact investment relatively new but not so new. I mean the first socially responsible investment fund was 1970s mutual fund. Now, is that impacting the normal market? Yes and no. But I do feel that this is very much a bubbling of a new system, uh, of a new requirement, as Mark is suggesting, of new view of how this whole system will work all together. So no change on one side and tremendous change on another side, if that is good news. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, just add very quickly, with Nadia, because I think it's important to mention some of us are going to be raising new funds uh, working for foreign direct investment of a country, it is easier today, uh, just because there was a significant emphasis and pool, f a pool uh, there's a lot of pool activity from the asset managers right now, to organize a fund related to sustainable investments slash associated with impact investing uh, in Europe or United States than any other fund. So I could give you the, the, some numbers. If on a traditional fund, you're raising capital and it's expected you're going to probably, it's going it's to be a long roadshow and a long process, 
12 months minimum, maybe, maybe more than that, in probably three to six months, if you have your sources lined up, if you have a great team and you have your portfolios ready to go, you should be able to get capital. There's capital ready to go, not from your traditional LPs. So your pension funds, your institutional, your corporate, no. It's family offices, it's your, you know, it's individuals who have been very successful and uh, great entrepreneurs and who feel that now we have to have this dynamic shift, as Nadia mentioned, in the world. So this is, this is so I would definitely think about those things because if you, and it, it's also encouraging a lot of different groups around and individuals to start thinking about organizing the investment, whether you're organizing an investment fund or portfolio, because you could raise capital today. You just have to have all your ducks lined up, and it's much easier to do it than in traditional industries today. Any other questions? Yeah? Wait, there's a microphone right here. I just wonder, um, reading a lot about sustainability and understanding the logic you go on today. But do you think that real sustainability uh, is possible to be achieved with this logic of growth? Can I direct to the two gentlemen that work in real economy, uh, who deal with real products that have to be sold and there has to be numbers um, growing year after year, if you can comment on that. I mean, I basically, to start with, what is our contribution? Uh, if we want to at least decouple the growth of, for example, of transport from CO2 emissions, then it's all about efficiency. This is our part of that game. But clearly, if you look in some of the places like uh, Changchun, Mexico cities and others, uh, it is fairly obvious that the current system of mobility, namely in these mega cities, is reaching a point where continuation or extrapolation of what we have seen in the past uh, will not be a realistic option. So uh, when you see that more and more municipalities in China refer to rather, let's say, uh, strong measures like linking access to inner cities to having a number plate that has been subject to a lottery, where the number of plates is obviously lower than demand for it, uh, you can see things coming, which mean much heavier restrictions on the use of cars than anything we know today, including London or Stockholm or other places. Uh, so this is one of the reasons uh, why, with the rather radical approach we have been taking to what's going to be named the BMW i3, or which was named before as a project titled the Megacity Vehicle, uh, we try to put to the market an offer which is uh, so outstanding in its sustainability credentials, including the way it is manufactured, that we are going to have a product which will have access to the future most restricted places on the planet under all conditions, but at a price. We are not in the business of basic mobility. We are not the alternative uh, to the subway. We are making products for <laughs> relatively wealthy people. Uh, and that is part of our answer to that challenge. But clearly, it's not going to be in 20 years or 10 years like it is now. The car industry now is undergoing a change which is going to be more fundamental than everything we have seen since the last war. And it's a challenge for everybody. And we hope by this approach to find our way through that and into a yeah, sustainable future for our company. Uh, we need, uh, <clears throat> if we want to, uh, to make sustainability, sustainability, uh, sustainable growth, uh, it is everything uh, combined also with the finance. Uh, not only the finance of the, of the, of the company which, which develops, uh, that develops something or produce something, also the finance in case of public finance, everything, banking sector. I, I'm coming from Slovenia, and I can tell, uh, I can talk about Slovenian, uh, 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 from so Slovenian point of view. That means 
uh, if we want to have stable growth, that means we need to be covered also from the banks, from the, from the financing uh, sector. The product what we are producing going on the street, that means in the, in the governmental uh, or, or in the municipality, and municipality are covered uh, uh, from, the, from the public finance. Uh, and if we don't have in the chain, chain completely financing for the completely product, that will also not be successful. Okay, we are oriented all, all over the world, but uh, also for the companies in Slovenia, uh, it is necessary to have really stable finance, project financing, not only uh, not only uh, 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 something what is already uh, uh, what's all, well, what already uh, what is already running, but also the new project, really project that are uh, uh, combined with uh, green energy and so on. Has to be whole system. Whole system, yeah. Uh, I just want to come and, and bring an interesting perspective. Nadia mentioned in, in the beginning of her conversation uh, something that struck me: the whole nutrition, which is as simple as nutrition. Uh, you, so you think about nutrition that, has, that is becoming needs to become more sustainable, and there's a whole new industry now being born that my colleagues and I are discussing and putting the whole platform of investors now in Europe and the United States and South, um, South America, it's called medical tourism. Medical tourism, which is a big industry here in Slovenia, uh, more than the other country in, in Europe, I would say, uh, this is a whole new model which is being shifted. Why is this new model uh, uh, becoming much more sustainable? Because people uh, are addressing, they want to be young, they want to feel and look younger, they want to address their issues, whether it's from cosmetics point of view, aesthetics. They want to uh, they want to take care of themselves, but also they don't want to pay the premium. Or maybe in certain countries they are just not affordable anymore. So this is an opportunity to create sustainable medical tourist resorts um, in uh, places such as Slovenia, but in different parts of the world. And there is a whole new economic business model which is based on this principle. And I think this whole uh, issue of people who are, feel things are very unaffordable, but yet at the same time want to try something different, maybe try a holistic medicine, a uh, different lifestyle approach, uh, this new model in sustainability like nutrition, medical tourism, will allow them to do just like that. I don't know. I want to come back to that first original question about growth versus sustainability. Um, there's a, a remarkable author um, in a great book, Cradle to Cradle. Uh, Bill McDonough, you probably read him. And his concept that um, we need to move from um, just a linear economy where we just take something from the ground, use it, and trash it into a circle economy. Uh, when you are in circle economy, whatever you produce now, this piece of paper is not waste, it's food for something else. And that's not the economy we face right now. We trash 99.9% .9 of whatever we use. So in that case, when you are in circle economy, it's not whether you want to grow or not to grow, it's what do you want to grow? Yeah? So that's the question, what do we want to grow? And I'm not sure if that's the question very often asked outside of this kind of ventures. Yeah? There's a question, two questions there. So one first lady on the back, and then, yeah, then let's in the other direction. Those would be the last two, what, three. Thank so you. this will be the three questions that we will okay. wrap up. M mine is a very short one. Can we build a new sustainable knowledge economy with the old ethics? I have some doubts there. My question is to, the, uh, to both uh, companies. Uh, so um, have you ever had any bad experience or how strong you are against those companies? that are your supply chain, part of your supply chain, or uh, distribution channels. So you have uh, to quit, or you had to, to uh, drive the attention in order to improve, to, to be more green or to live green, as your policy is. Thank you. Actually, those two questions are deeply connected. So uh, if you, the second question is, I understood, have you ever faced an ethical challenge with your supplier and how did you, did you deal with that? Which is pretty much the first question. How do we deal with ethics and all of this? So. Well, that's only a few weeks ago where we were notified uh, by an external source, by an NGO about uh, improper production processes uh, at the fifth 
tier of our supply chain. So the supply of the supply of the supply of the supply of us. Um, so we have direct contacts until that reach into tier two. So we spoke to the tier one guys and the tier two guys and the tier two guys then sent a letter to their supplier and said, unless this is stopped, you're not going to be any more our supplier. And uh, as far as we know, uh, it has been fixed by the guys on uh, tier three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, we are coming from automotive industry, and I can tell you in automotive industry, the rules uh, uh, are so set it so hard, that means you need to follow the rules if you want to be uh, in the future the supplier for the automotive, automotive chain. Uh, uh, and I can confirm that uh, what uh, Mr. Becker says, it is clearly we have to, uh, uh, the, the end customer go to the tier one and check everything. The tier one need to check by tier two, and we need to check by the tier three and so on. All chain, completely chain, need to be checked. If somebody in, the, in this chain doesn't work according to the rules what we got from the uh, OEMs, uh, then they need to be replaced. And uh, I think uh, in, in the past it was uh, a lot of uh, 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 some of samples that it doesn't work, but uh, in lately we cannot, I cannot uh, imagine anymore that somebody who wants to deliver in the future to us or to, to BMW, uh, for example, uh, to, to, to break the rules. Um, just a few general comments that I would make. I think, as I mentioned in the beginning of my conversation, I'm against government uh, interference and government regulations. Uh, I think that it comes down to the ethics it comes down to the type of company you as the CEO, uh, whether it's a vendor or, or a company that is part of a supply chain, what are you, uh, how are you building this company? At what morals, at what values, what norms? And I think in the future, if you are not an ethical company and without the value system, uh, you're simply not gonna be a player. Uh, I think it's a system which has, that it's gonna be, I think in the future it's gonna be an exchange, uh, a trust identity exchange, and I think that's, that issue will go away. Uh, I think what we're seeing it right now is because there's a lot of disturbances and a lot of noise in the system and uh, over-regulation and unethical business practices on behalf of various corporations and businesses, but I think if you go back to the building the companies in, the, in building great companies, uh, focusing on the consumer and customer, customer centricity and creating companies uh, like um, you know Singapore Airlines, for example, or Tesco, or others that are you know BMW, uh, others that are part of this whole uh, sustainable uh, corporate value system. Uh, you're not going to face those problems, and I think uh, it comes down early on in education, where the senior leadership of that company should be you know much more proactive, and I think there should be a lot more done on educating people why. Why, why ethics is so important and how you behave and go into the future. Uh, maybe one sentence or two. Uh, in Slovenia, we have a big problem with uh, skilled, uh, skilled uh, uh, people because it's not enough uh, uh, technical people for our pro products, for our production. And in the case, if we wouldn't work ethic ethical, and uh, uh, good with the people, uh, they will go away. And fluctuation in our company is almost zero. And that is the most important message. Uh, be be uh, work team and so Forthcoming. on. Forthcoming. Sure. Yeah. Sure. There's a very last question which we promised. It's not a question, it's a, it's a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. My name is Ibrahim from African Forum. I think that uh, sustainability is possible. It's not only possible, but it's also a new paradigm for the development. Uh, but sustainability also has to take in consideration the culture. It's very important. So, so I mean, environment, environment natural, natural, social, economic, and culture. It's very important. Just because I'm mostly from Slovenia, uh, here, if you see this beautiful forest in Slovenia, this forest uh, growth the last 40 years, as I know, on the principle of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So 
It's possible, as uh, uh, Mr. Grant tell us, to us also, it's difficult to be uh, to work on it, but it's uh, take a time to be to get results. Sure. Thank you very much, and I have to say also thanks for the organizer to invite me, and uh, I have to apologize because my English is not perfect. I rather speak in Slovene or in French, but I try in, <laughs> in English also. Thank, Thank you. you. Well. I would like to respond to the question on ethics as a kind of conclusion. Um, do we need new ethics? Do we need new values? Uh, I was flying from US a couple of weeks ago, and I picked up in the airport a book uh, called Grand Pursuit, which is a wonderful summary on the history of economics. How did the economics come about as a science? And it was wonderful for me to discover that economics as a science came up about as a grand pursuit, first time in history, somebody said that maybe poverty is not a God's will. Maybe we actually can do something about it. Maybe the wealth of nation is in our hands, um, and wealth not in the sense of just financial wealth, but in the sense of cultural wealth, emotional wealth, relational wealth, every sense of wealth. So the concept of economics originally was wonderful. How about instead of just being victims of our environment, just create goodness for all? I think that's also true for business. If you think of the history of the word of business, before it showed up in 17, early 1700s, and can derived from the word busyness, which is not the most exciting word in the world, busyness and anxiety, those are the two origins of the word business. Before that, every culture had its own word. For example, in Sweden, Narnsliv means nourishment for life. That was the word for business for centuries. In Russian, that is dela, which is a kind of higher calling, a purpose. So most of our cultures have a sense of business being the one that takes care and creates something beautiful and meaningful. So I don't know if we need new ethics. I think this short last 50, 70, maybe 100 years of obsession with short-term profit maximization is just a glitch in the system, and we just need to come back to the old ones. And with that, I hope we have a wonderful, enjoyable lunch. We have small gifts for our presenters, which is the book I managed to write recently, and then I will pass it back to Danisa. Nadia for leading this panel so nicely and we learned a lot and thank you very much dear panelists for all your contributions we really enjoyed it